There is a fascinating show on at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, which is called Tree and Serpent, uh, Early Buddhist Art in India. Now, it's particularly, I think, unusual to have a show nowadays about Buddhist art, and in particular about early Buddhist art. Uh, early Buddhism is something that's a question in some of, uh, some of the academic studies, particularly in the United States. They've called into question the whole idea of early Buddhism. Well, here's a show of early Buddhist art that I think uh, illustrates a lot of the points that we're trying to make when we're trying to emphasize the importance of early Buddhism. Now, this show was actually originally scheduled to open several years ago, but then COVID intervened and they postponed the show to open this year, 2023. And it'll be open until uh, basically mid-November of 2023. I'll put links to uh, the show uh, down below in the notes. But before I get to uh, my description of the show, because I went to, to visit it and have uh, some more photographs, a few photographs and some information that might be of interest, uh, a little bit of my own news, which is that I received this uh, a few days ago. This is a Google Silver Play button. I'll open it up, take the cover off here, Woo! Uh, which is for 100,000 subscribers. I'll be hanging it up on the wall back there at some point in the near future, uh, so you'll see it in, in future videos. I just wanted to thank all of you for uh, watching, for subscribing, for commenting, for supporting the work that uh, I'm doing here on this channel, and that indeed that we're all together doing in making the world a, a better place, kinder, uh, calmer, more wise. Uh, and so in any event, uh, I just wanted to show you this, a little bit of uh, news from the, the channel from my own point of view. So in any event, this show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York covers uh, the history of early Buddhist art, we might say, with a kind of a broad brush. There's a thesis, I think, in the show, which is that the early Buddhist art, the earliest Buddhist art, really can be found more in the south, southern India, rather than in north India. Up until now, when we hear of uh, uh, early Buddhist art, Probably our number one example is going to be Gandhara. Some of you may, may be familiar with uh, statues, uh, work from Gandhara in uh, northwestern India, or actually in Pakistan now, but you know, in that same uh, uh, milieu of, of ancient India. And Gandhara was famous for being a kind of a crossroads, in particular, a crossroads bringing in influence from Greece and Rome, uh, the Hellenism that came with Alexander the Great during his conquests, as well as being a route towards China and East Asia. Uh, so Gandhara is extremely important in that regard, but by being important, it's kind of overshadowed the importance of South India, of the indigenous causes and conditions behind a lot of Buddhist art. And so this show, in a lot of ways, aims to counteract that uh, overemphasis on the north to turn our gaze towards southern India. So where did Buddhist art really begin? It's impossible to say for sure, but we might point to the earliest stupas as the examples of the earliest Buddhist art. Stupas were, at least it's said, constructed right after the Buddha's death in order to inter his earthly remains, the, 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 the bones and so on that came out of the funeral pyre. And in the show, they have a reconstruction, uh, a small uh, model scale, a uh, small model reconstruction of what one of these early stupas might have looked like. Uh, I took a photograph here, you can see it in the exhibit, as well as some of the relics that came out of one of these supposed stupas. I will discuss these relics in a future video because it's, it's sort of a little bit too much for me to get into right here. And here we have a second photo uh, that I took at the exhibit of a representation of uh, an early stupa. This, act, this, this uh, stella, this, this stone here is apparently from around the first century of the Common Era, so a bit later, but may represent one of these early stupas. And it has within it a smaller representation of a tooth relic, uh, perhaps a tooth of the Buddha, or at least 
supposed to be a tooth of the Buddha, we can see it sort of uh, apparently inside one of the stupas. Now, going beyond stupas, otherwise, uh, we find uh, some of the earliest examples of Buddhist art as representations of nature deities, what are known as yakas or yakshas, uh, serpents and nagas, and trees. And that's part of the reason why this exhibit is called Tree and Serpent, because those were some of the earliest sort of representations that we find in Buddhist art. These uh, go back, at least in the exhibit, as far as I can tell, the earliest ones are about the second century uh, before the Common Era, so perhaps uh, a century, two, well, let's say it's two centuries after the Buddha's lifetime, or, or so, uh, more or less. Uh, and these were representations, as I say, of nature, nature deities, nature forces, and Nagas were also sort of nature uh, deities and forces, uh, trees were uh, thought of as being holy and containing uh, deities of certain kinds, and we find uh, mention of such deities, yakas, uh, nagas, trees, of course, in the early Buddhist suttas as well. They're very much mentioned there, so it, it makes it's it's not surprising that these kinds of things would then be represented in the very earliest Buddhist artwork. For an example of a yaka or one of these nature deities, uh, I didn't take a photograph, but I, this is the catalog for the ex exhibit. And here you can see an example uh, of one of these yakas. Uh, this one, they say in the uh, exhibit, would have been named. There are actually remains of, of some uh, writing at the top, uh, but it, they can't make out the exact name. This probably would have been a particular yaka or yaksha uh, at a particular place that would have been named. It is actually riding on top of a kind of a sea serpent at the bottom, uh, which would have been its kind of vehicle. And this is being, again, put to Buddhist use. It's not simply, uh, before the lifetime of the Buddha, this would have simply been an, a, a kind of a nature deity in a particular place that people would have perhaps sacrificed to, would have perhaps prayed to would have perhaps asked for uh, help and intercession, and now the Buddha was the person that they were doing this, and, and so therefore uh, this nature deity would have then looked towards the Buddha. For an example of a Naga or one of these serpents, we can see the, the cover of the, the catalog shows a very clear example of such a Naga in the early, these uh, early times, early Buddhist art. This is from around the first century before the Common Era, the the yaka I was showing before was from around the second century before the Common Era. These are relatively early uh, Buddhist art forms. For an example of a tree, uh, let me point, take one out, a tree from the catalog. Here is an example of an early tree form. Uh, this, this particular one comes from uh, around the second century before the Common Era. It's a wish-giving tree, uh, a tree that gives uh, wealth. And so you can sort of barely see at the bottom there, there are some sacks of coins. At the time, uh, these coins were square in shape uh, rather than being round the way we know them now. And so there's sort of ba bags of these square shaped coins. Now, art like this pretty clearly takes time, effort, and money to prepare. So it's done for particular reasons. It's not just done at random. Uh, in particular, it's done perhaps uh, for the reason to teach the Dharma, as we call didactic purposes, to teach the Dharma to people who might not have known about it, to teach the Buddha's life, facts of the Buddha's life, to people who might not known, have known about him. It's for purposes of reverence, uh, to revere the Buddha or the Dharma in various ways, to show reverence, and also in a more minor way to uh, celebrate the donors of the artwork. I don't have, I'm not going to show images of the donors, but at the later part of this exhibit at the Met, there are a few examples of portraits, of what appear to be portraits of donors uh, that, that uh, presumably were partly funded by those donors. So when we discuss the idea of reverential or devotional artwork, we can sort of, we can certainly think of donors as doing this, uh, supporting this kind of work out of reverence or devotion, but the actual artwork itself is an example of devotion, 
or at least exe exemplifying devotion, we can think of that uh, particular uh, portrait or uh, example of the yaka as being devotional in that way. It's reorienting the kind of cosmos with, instead of us uh, giving devotion or reverence to the yaka, to this uh, nature deity, instead the yaka is giving reverence or devotion to the Buddha. So the, the Buddha becomes the apex, the focus of our, our attention and efforts, rather than these other nature deities, which are then uh, demoted in a sense to become lesser and looking up towards the Buddha. This is a kind of devotional practice. Also, as I say, much of this early artwork was intended to uh, describe or be didactic, teach the Dharma, teach about the Buddha's lifetime. Now, what's particularly interesting, however, about some of this early artwork is that it occurred at a time of what's known as an iconism, when there seems to have been a reaction against portraying the actual physical body or representation of the physical body of the Buddha. Portraying the Buddha in human form simply wasn't thought of for a number of centuries as being very appropriate. And what resulted from this kind of uh, understanding of artwork, this aniconic understanding of artwork of the Buddha, is some of what seemed to me to be the most powerful, some of the most powerful images in all of Buddhist art. Images that revolve around absence rather than presence, which is really quite surprising in artwork in general. Indeed, the the, the circle behind me, a, a very a much more recent uh, kind of form out of Zen in particular, uh, I think harkens back to some of this kind of earlier artwork of absence. So, for example, we have the idea of the, the footprints of the Buddha. In this cover image, we can see the Naga, and the Naga is actually uh, 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 coiled around these uh, footprints of the Buddha here, which are an example of the Buddha's absence. There's probably, this is probably a throne here, an a, a throne where the Buddha would have sat upon, but of course the Buddha is now gone, has died, so all that remains is his footprints. And this example of footprints is repeated in other uh, exhibit, uh, examples in the exhibit. Here's a, 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 a good example of very large footprints. Uh, we can think here of uh, one of the early suttas that talks about the Four Noble Truths being uh, one of the great uh, examples of the Buddha's teaching of the Dharma, and the Four Noble Truths are kind of like the elephant's footprint, where all of the Dharma fits into the Four Noble Truths, sort of like all of the footprints of all the animals fit into the elephant's footprint. And the uh, the Buddha being kind of like that elephant's footprint, there's a there are some early suttas on this very topic. Or uh, an example of the riderless horse. Uh, this is supposed to be uh, teaching us about the time when the Buddha supposedly left home on his horse, on horseback, leaving the, the palace life in order to take on a life of, of, of hardship and, and searching for uh, enlightenment. And of course the Buddha's gone, so we don't have the Buddha on the horse, the, hor the riderless horse is supposed to remind us of that time in the Buddha's life. And of course there's a very famous wheel of the Dharma coming from the Buddha's first sermon, uh, the sermon of the, where he begins the, the rolling on of the, of the Dharma wheel. And uh, since that time, uh, uh, the wheel is this kind of aniconic, this, this example of the, of the Buddha's teaching without showing the Buddha's human form. And then, of course, as we have, uh, as, we, as I mentioned before, there are other images of the footprints and the empty throne. Here's another one. So, as I say, many of these images had a clear didactic purpose. That was to, to teach particular parts of the Dharma, perhaps the, the remind us of the wheel of the, of the first sermon, perhaps to remind us of uh, events in the Buddha's life, such as his leaving home. But also, I think, the very depiction of absence is supposed to be illustrative of, of key examples of the Dharma. That is, that the Buddha had gone beyond birth and death. He was not going to be reborn again because of uh, his, his 
uh, attainment of enlightenment, on a traditional understanding. And so that, in a sense, is, is gotten across to us in this imagery because the Buddha's not there. He's not been reborn, if you like. He's died and not been reborn. He's beyond birth and death. He's beyond the grasp of Mara, Mara being the tempter. In many places in the early suttas, it's mentioned that somebody who becomes enlightened is beyond Mara's grasp, is in some sense measureless, it's said. They can't be measured by ordinary human understanding to that extent because they're not in the grasp of, of, of the standard uh, 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 concepts of greed, hatred, and, and delusion. So in a sense, such people, people who are enlightened, are beyond representation. Certainly after they've died, there's a sense in which they're beyond representation. In particular, the Buddha himself was sort of thought of that way, at least during this early aniconic period. The exhibition also illustrates cross-cultural pollination between India and the West, in particular in Greece and Rome, through some examples of, of artwork that is found in either culture of the other. So, for example, we have this uh, uh, Poseidon, early Poseidon, from uh, the first century uh, of the Common Era that was found in India. And apparently this is one of many such uh, statues and, of course, coinage as well, uh, coming out of uh, Hellenism or even ancient Rome into India. So, and, and coins, of course, would have had uh, figures on them. They would have had artwork on them. And this artwork, these figures, then were uh, indeed uh, important in, in transforming the art of India. There's also, I think, which is equally, if not more fascinating, an example of a, an early female yaka, known as a yakini, that was found in, in Pompeii, that was actually dug up in Pompeii recently, but is from around the first century of the Common Era in India. It apparently was in the villa of a, uh, a trader, a merchant, and presumably this merchant was a merchant who was doing trade from Pompeii into India, and so doing some tr along that trade route, he would have perhaps bought this particular statue and brought it back with him to Pompeii. And with this influence from ancient Greece, from uh, the West, from Rome, in particular through coinage and again these small statues, it seems as though the early uh, reticence against portraying the Buddha in human form began to evaporate. And over the first few centuries of the Common Era, we began to see more and more physical representations of the Buddha, the kind that we're all familiar with. There's one uh, behind me on the on uh, the, 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 the shelf, uh, looking out the window. And, uh, of course, they're all over the place now. Uh, one of the most famous places where this happened, of course, was in Gandhara, to the north, where we see a, a real, uh, a very uh, fluid uh, and fruitful kind of interaction between uh, Greek statuary techniques and uh, Indian uh, ideas of artwork and, of course, the Buddha himself and bodhisattvas and other things, although that also did happen in the South. And so this show at the Met is, is highlighting uh, Southern, particularly Southern uh, Buddha uh, figures. However, one of, I would say one of my favorite Buddha figures is not in the show. It's a Buddha figure from the first or second century of the Common Era, that is very early, uh, from Gandhara, uh, uh, which is actually also in the Met's permanent collection. So although you can't see it in the show, you can go other place, in other place in the museum and find it if you want to. It's, again, one of my favorite because it's, it's a very uh, clearly a Greek or Roman uh, example, Greek, I would say, uh, showing the Buddha with a mustache and a lot of hair and a sort of a starburst pattern behind his head, which is really quite fascinating. But in any event, there is much, much more in this exhibit that I have that I've not gone through here. I've only given you a very small uh, 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 example of a few of the pieces, but there are many, many more. I would highly recommend going to see it if you happen to be in or around New York City uh, before sort of mid-November of 2023. I've linked uh, some of the 
parts, the web page for the show down below. So if you come to this video late, that web page should still be available showing some other uh, visual images from the show um, that you can see afterwards. Now, if you want to know more about that kind of aniconic period in Buddhist art and how it changed, because it really did radically change over the centuries after, I have an earlier video on that whole topic, and I'll put a link to it up here on the screen right now if you haven't seen it or would like to see it again. Thanks so much for watching, and if you would like to help support the, the, the channel, this channel, and the work that I'm doing here, consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked down below and here on the screen and see if you want, again, to help support uh, the work that I'm doing. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.